I'm Swami Chidbrahmananda. I'm, I'm posted in the Hollywood Center and uh, have been, I guess, in the Hollywood Center for at least the last nine years or so, although eight of them I was out in Washington, D.C. and just came back here about six months ago. So I'm back at one of my favorite centers here to share some of my favorite ideas that I've found in a multitude of scriptures. Today we're going to dig a lot into Vivekananda's writings, of course. I'm going to start with a Sufi mystic, but the outline for today's lecture actually comes from the Philokalia, which is a writing on uh, interior prayer by Christian monks in the 14th and 15th centuries. And I've been studying that set of books uh, and, and am just delighted to find such a deep discussion of mantra practice, of meditation practice, within a Western Christian tradition uh, that was taken with all the seriousness of that the Eastern Orthodox Church, where they, they're literally spending hours and hours uh, in practice of these um, methods for touching the divine. You know, the goal always... <laughs> you get in trouble when you frame things that way. The goal always... The goal sometimes might be... <laughs> to... To know God, to know the truth about what you are. What does it mean to know God? I mean, that's a kind of a tall order. One, because certainly none of us would be able to decide exactly what we mean by that word. But this notion of understanding you, understanding why you're here. What, what, what are you? You know, we have a word, a human being. But what is that? And what's the point of us having so much intelligence, com seeming intelligence, compared to the other animal kingdom? Why is it that we feel compelled to develop and to grow and to learn and to study? What is the nature within us? And why does it seem like there's a purpose? Why does it seem like there's a point to being? And why does it seem so obscure? So we're hoping to look at ideas around that find solutions to confusions around that, and just enjoy the divine bliss. You know, these ideas, it's, it's always good to remember uh, that we, we, we have such easy access to these principles and ideas these days. I mean, you can go to the library, most of us, even in our own homes, go to the bookshelf and pull out the Vedas, pull out the Quran, pull out the scriptures of, you know, Taoism or Buddhism, and have access to these truths. But in the past, it wasn't always like that. All these words that we've been able to print out and make so readily available, they were purchased with a huge amount of effort, entire lifetimes of effort and practice. You know, just the Vedas, the, the Indian scriptures, the Upanishads that we, that we study and uh, really cherish here. Uh, I know of a Swami, the Swami up in San Francisco, uh, you know, that he, as early as three or four years old, had to sit down with his father and begin memorizing uh, his family's assigned section of the Vedas. You know, that's what the Brahmins, that's why they were set aside as a group of people in India and why it was such a crime to kill a Brahmin or to, uh, you know, get in the way of <laughs> a Brahmin, why they were a high caste, was because there was a time when these things weren't written down and they were passed from generation to generation to generation orally. And if, if, you know, one of these young men who had finished memorizing his section of the scriptures was, you know, taken out of commission, we might have lost an entire section uh, of the of these scriptures. And so it's always to know that we're carrying on a tradition that's not weeks old, not years, not centuries, but actually millennia. And that a lot of people have dedicated their entire life to giving us this information, to showing us these inner discoveries that come with a lot of focus and a lot of effort, a lot of renunciation, a lot of the ideals that we hold up. And to just frame our minds in that way as we think about it and as we jump into this conversation on attention, the different aspects of what attention is. It's that ability to focus, that ability to control the mind, that ability to be authentic uh, in what you are. So to start, I'm going to just read a playful little uh, poem by Hafiz, a Sufi mystic. <laughs> it's an odd one, I have to say, but I like it. It's called The Prettiest Mule, so that warns you right away. <laughs> Sometimes a mule does not know what is best for itself. 
When the mind is confused like that, it secretly desires a master with a skilled whip to guide it to those playgrounds on earth's table where the sweet ones, light, has made life more tasty. Hafiz always carries such a whip, but I rarely need to use it. I prefer just turning myself into the prettiest mule in town and making my tail sing and wag, knowing that your heart will follow. <laughs> so this is that notion of following God, the prettiest mule, of falling in love. That's really what we're about here, is falling in love with the divine, falling in love with each other for that divine spark that we see and recognize in the world around us. Uh, one of my favorite reliefs was when I read uh, Swamiji's word that religion was not here to stop us from enjoying the world or stop us from enjoying life, but that religion exists to teach us how to enjoy life so that we, we don't get stuck in that spiral of pleasure and pain where we just kind of get put through the ringer. So to do that and to prepare the mind for that and to be able to see life as it is, to be able to get that silence inside that's necessary for that focus. Uh, Nicephorus, a monk in the Philokalia from the 1400s, had broken down, I think, eight different points or aspects of this paying attention, of this ability to focus within. He says, some of the saints have called attention the safekeeping of the mind, others the guarding of the heart, yet others sobriety, and still even others, mental silence, and others again by other names. But all of these names mean the same thing. Why is it that we meditate? Why are we so interested in controlling the mind? Why are we so concerned about repeating a mantra or God's name without ending? He says here that, it's, that this attention, this effort, is for safekeeping of the mind. Safekeeping of the mind from what? From going out. You know, it naturally is inclined to go out to look for its definition. And it's quite often what gets wrong ideas or fantasies and lead us in directions that go nowhere, or worse, directions that go into misery, go into bondage. And so we want to get a control of this mind, and we want to safe keep or safeguard that original mind, the mind that's not confused, the mind that exists in a simple reality that hasn't come up with ideas and machinations based on a wrong idea of who it is. And what are those wrong ideas? To think that you're a body, the scriptures say, the sages have told us, is the wrong idea. To make decisions on your life based solely on you as a physical form. To decide what you need in this world based solely on your physical form. These are things that are going to lead you into a, to a, a circular, I guess, uh, spiral that aren't going to take you where you need to go and aren't going to fulfill you. Because there's three components to us. There's this body, this physical self. There's the mind, uh, the screen upon which consciousness reflects ourself back to ourself. And then there's the self, the watcher. And a large part of practice in the beginning is coming to the point where you can sense or at least experience the separation of those three components. Ramakrishna talks about the ripe coconut you know, that, that a ripe ego is like a ripe coconut, which means that if you've seen a ripe coconut, the inside has dried and pulled away from the shell so you can shake it and you can hear it rattle. So it's become three distinct pieces, that outer husk, the shell, and then that inner core, the, the actual coconut meat inside. And so he's saying that we're wanting to get our minds very much in that same condition where we're well aware of the separation between body and mind. We're well, well aware of the separation between mind and self and that we have a full understanding of all three of those components and their relationship to one another. That all of these things, this world at large, is the projection of the mind, on the mind of this conscious self, that one without a second. And that the body is a step down from that. It's a tool that we have basically have created of our own effort in order to manifest our own quest, to manifest our own understanding, to manifest our own sense of self and the tool by which we grow, the tool by which we learn, you know, that, the learn to act. So the safekeeping of the mind is keeping out untruth, keeping out ignorant ideas about ourselves. And the ideas of keeping attention really is about keeping the mind focused 
on the thought of the divine, on your highest ideal, however you want to use that word, God, the divine, your highest ideal, the the one reality that we're all experiencing. Because the scriptures say that it exists as a singularity, as a wholeness, and that its nature is pure love, unconditioned, that its nature is pure intelligence, and that its nature is this very experience of being, this existence. And that if we can get the mind quiet, if you can get the mind still, that's what manifests in you. You don't become a nice person by practicing how to be a nice person. <laughs> you practice, you, pra- you become a nice person by eliminating all the limitations that you have based on body and mind that make you think that you need to take or need to grab or need to shore up or need to have something from this world. You know, in the scriptures, in the Bhagavad Gita, it's very clear that the soul, the self, that which is watching your mind at this moment, that which was curious or, or brought you here today, that asked the question, what, 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 what's going on with my life? <laughs> what do I need to know? That part of you which watches your thoughts, that part of you which gauges your body, that part is, is ever free, and it's of that nature, and it will manifest when there's silence in the mind, when there's not a competing idea of what it is. Our effort is to return back to a single person. And you say, well, how? I, of course I'm a single person. Well, what I'm talking about is more subtle than that. It's in your mind being a single person. You know, when you think, it's generally your mind talking and you're listening. That's a two-person undertaking. <laughs> Someone's talking and someone's listening. When you know that you should get up at a particular hour in the morning, the alarm goes off, and there's a conversation, an argument in your head. I don't feel like getting up right now. Oh, but you should get up. That conversation is taking two people. So you've become two people. And what happens when you've become two people, when you've broken broken your inner world into a multiplicity like that, because it's not often just two, two beings that we become, we can break it into three or four also. The, way the, 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 the method for bringing that back to its center is to silence the mind altogether so that this natural self, this authentic self, that is love, that is intelligent, that is this existence in its entirety, can manifest out. And so we have this idea of the mantra, where we repeat a name of God, or something that represents our highest ideal. In a, you know, for us, it's always the name of God. Uh, And you take refuge in that name. The scriptures say that that name, that, that mantra that you're repeating, and God are not separate. That the mind will, will feel that indication. Like, if I say to you milk, you immediately think of milk. It's, it would be almost impossible for me to say that word to you and for it not to arise in you, the thought of milk. Ramakrishna says that that name, that mantra, that practice, is God. That when you say the name of God, whatever that name is for you, that indication occurs in the mind. And it will continue to grow every time that you repeat it, every time you try to say it more authentically, when you, with more understanding and more depth uh, in the repetition that concept grows and eventually becomes presence within you. At the beginning, it seems like I'm just trying to make an imaginary friend that I carry around and who reminds me that life is flowers and happiness and goodness. That's the initial stage of spiritual life, and that usually is born out of fear, Swami Vivekananda says. That it's, we have this sense of self which is very small and very fragile and doesn't have a very wide-reaching sense of control, and we're, we're, we're living in a universe that's separate from us, seemingly, that we've called that. And we have no idea what its nature is. Sometimes it seems horribly violent. Sometimes it seems immensely beautiful. Sometimes it seems overwhelming. Sometimes it seems utterly boring. <laughs> but the fact is, we deal with it and we try to interface with it and try to understand its nature. So some of the saints have called this attempt at attention or this attempt of focusing the mind, calming the mind, safekeeping of the mind, protecting this machine, protecting this ability, whatever, this faculty that you have to think, to reason, to wonder, to imagine, to make sure that you keep that instrument in perfect working condition, you know, that you don't 
get off center in it. It doesn't start wobbling. The thinking goes awry. You become super selfish or super arrogant or super sexual or super whatever it is. All of these different possibilities that the mind can take on these colors and manifest them. With this infinite energy that, called the soul that it has within, but it's not a true representation. It's a wobbly representation. And so there's, and there's, we're going to look at methods for keeping that mind safe from those kinds of things. Guarding of the heart, staying tender, not becoming jaded by the world, not becoming mean-spirited, not, not being entertained by being vulgar to each other or to other people or, or saying harsh things. To not get caught up in cycles of hatred based on ego, where I'm right and you're wrong. I'm this way and you're that way. I can't do anything with you. To break down those things and to guard them from taking over the heart, from making the heart hard, from making the heart inaccessible. Working up calluses of the heart, I guess. Mm -hmm. And this sobriety, this is an interesting thing. This sobriety based on the notion that this input from the senses can cause us to get inebriated, to get drunk. We, we think incorrectly. I know that every one of us have had that experience in life where you've done something that wasn't altogether great for you. And you're like, oh my God, how could I have done that? Well, why was I dancing on the table? Why, what, you know, I don't even remember what happened. And then you hear what happened. You're like, oh my God, what is going on? This is what we're guarding against because that's a drunken approach to life and that's going to be haphazard. You're going to suffer for it. And we're just trying, like the Buddha, to minimize suffering, to know the nature of what we're dealing with. We don't get caught. And then this mental silence. This is an interesting one, especially for Western audiences, because quite often we have this idea that thinking is what makes us smart or thinking is what makes us who we are. It's what makes the world go. And when you read the scriptures and they, the sages tell us, Stop with the thinking. Stop with the reasoning. Immediately we're like, well, isn't that just what religion would say? <laughs> Stop thinking, just be a dumb sheep, you know, do what you're told. That's not the idea here. The idea here is that you are already that which you are seeking. You already have all that you need, but that you can't connect with that inner self because you're distracted by an active mind that can't be controlled. You're distracted by an activated body that's constantly crying out with needs and desires and wants. And you haven't done the work to find the separation, to know that the body is not you, that the mind is not you. And to understand that the you that is you, that I, that sense of being within, holds all of the power that activates all of the things you're fighting in your life. And when you identify with mind, you split your sentience. You give the mind half of your sentience because the mind has no power, no doing power at all, separate from you. It thinks about the things you're interested in thinking about. It goes to the places you're interested in it taking you. It's not a separate entity that has its own sentience. When it argues in the sense of the conscience inside, that's because you have confused yourself with it. You've split your sense of I and given it power to argue with you. When the body starts arguing with you, you know, about getting out of bed or not wanting to brush its teeth or whatever it might be, that's because you've identified with the body, you've given it a sense of I, and that sentient power that you've split, it now, now becomes part of the conversation, part of the argument going on inside. So we're going to look at different aspects of becoming an authentic, singular, whole person by studying this idea of attention, of focus, of self-control. His first definition, he says, attention is a sign of sincere repentance. Now, normally we have a deep, under, deep well, not a misunderstanding necessarily, but a wrong emphasis on the word repentance. You know, we're always like, that's always when you recoil your hand because it's been slapped and you won't do that again. It's always got this negative connotation. But what we're talking about here is a 180 degree turnaround of your focus inside. The answer to your life isn't in what you need to do, where you need to go, what you need to accomplish, what you need to be. That's why those things don't fulfill us. That's why when we try and look through those things, it just gets more and more frenetic. You know, you keep gathering more and more responsibility and that brings on more and more responsibility, which 
gets you more and more distracted. We make more and more money, and that takes more and more attention and more and more responsibility and more and more management, and life gets more and more and more complex. We're looking for a sincere repentance that's turning away from the idea of being defined in the sense world, being defined by a body and a mind, and coming to, a, to an unchanging self that isn't dependent on the development of a body or the development of a mind. That self whose nature has always been there, the you that was you when you were five, even when your body was radically different than it is now. It's that continu continuity of being that we all share. And that's where we have to establish ourselves. That's where the fulfillment is. That's where the bliss of being is. That's where, where, where life happens in its truest sense. He says, the self-existent one projected the senses outwards, and therefore a man looks outward, not within himself. So Vivekananda is saying that that's our first problem, is that the senses look out. And so we step into them and we look out. In the, you know, in the, in the Christian scripture in the Old Testament, you have the story of creation. And uh, one of my favorite studies was kind of coming to the idea that that, that creation wasn't a one-time event that now is done and here we're just stuck with the consequences. But that story is a repeating story. And I think we've talked about that in a lecture a few, oh, quite a while back, actually. But this notion that that, that, that story steps through this process through Eve, you know, when she goes and she sees the forbidden fruit, the fruit that's going to give her the knowledge of good and evil, the first thing she says about it, oh, it's beautiful, right? So that catches our senses. Oh, look at that. It's beautiful. The second thing she said about it was that, oh, it looks like it could be good for food. I need it. I want it. I'm going to take it and make it a part of me. And the third thing, that it would give her wisdom. She thought, oh, well, it's going to make me like God, is how she worded it. This idea that somehow we're going to get that missing piece from outside, from in the sen the, through the senses somehow. So we live our life living through the senses, reaching for this fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And actually what that is, it's the birth of ego. You know, because when you base your sense of self on your body, an ego is born, a separation, a fence that says anything not body is not me. You know, and it's the same thing with the mind. So we set up that distinction. So the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil that Eve ate in the garden wasn't some exotic fruit. It was the sense of ego that before, Ad, before she had made a decision separate and apart from the divine presence within, from her divine nature, if she had sat and not gone into the conversation with the serpent in that situation in the garden, she wouldn't have forgotten that she was already like God. She was made in the image of God. There's nothing out there that she needed in order to, to be like God. You know, she lacked nothing. She was allowed to eat from everything else in the garden. And she was even sort of a way to eat allowed there. It's just God forbade it because he's like, if you do that, you're going to die. You're going to die a spiritual death. You're going to lose your sense of self. You're going to lose your sense of contentment, your sense of being. So we're trying to undo that. We're trying to turn around and not go out through our senses to find out who we are. The self-existent one projected the senses outward, and therefore a man looks outward and not within himself. A certain wise one, desiring immortality with inverted senses, perceived the self within. These were the great rishis. Those myth mythological probably existed, but immemorial time, time before there were records, time before we even kept a history or have any history left, these seven rishis went and did this work. We're going to go, we're going to find out what the nature of ourself and this life is, and we're not going to rest until we do. And that's where the Vedas were born, you know, the beginning of scripture, not revealed in a sense of any magic portion, but it's where they kept their records on what worked, what didn't work, what brought them to when they had that unitive experience, how did they get there, what did they do to find that. And those records have been kept and they're, they're updated and they're maintained, you know, all, even up to the present day. They're not, they're not a static literature. They're ongoing. If you discover a new way to realize God, you can write your own little addendum to the Vedas. And if it works, it'll be propagated <laughs> from generation to generation. So a certain wise one desiring immortality inverted his senses and perceived the self within. 
As I've already said, the first inquiry that we find in the Vedas was concerning outward things. And then a new idea came that the reality of, th the reality of things is not to be found in the external world, not by looking outward, but by turning the eyes, as it is literally expressed, inward. And the word used for the soul is very significant. It is he who has gone inward, the innermost reality of your being, the heart center, the core, from which, as it were, everything comes out, the central sun of which the mind, the body, the sense organs, and everything else we have are but rays going outward. So this notion of not going out anymore, and what's the reason that you don't go out? Well, we know from science, which is the same religion, but going outward, the, the, the Vedanta is the same, it's the same scientific approach, but going inward. And the reason was, as we go outward, every, every particle that we find, we find indications, oh my gosh, there's, there's still another one, a, still a smaller one. Every fact that we learn, everything, everything that we pick up, you know, Vivekananda says you can pick up a grain of sand and spend the rest of your life studying that grain of sand. And at the end of your life, you will still know only a fraction more about that grain of sand than when you started. Because as you go out, things bifurcate. It gets more and more complicated, more and more information. Every question answered presents five more that aren't answered. And so the rishis saw really quickly, wow, that's, you know, that's like trying to put a forest fire out one, one pine needle at a time. That's not going to work. And so it occurred to him, hey, it bottlenecks here. I, I am the experiencer of all of this. Let's try and go in where the stream narrows to study the, the reality of this. So the senses and the sense organs, everything that we have are but rays going outward. Men of childish intellect, ignorant persons, run after desires which are external and enter the trap of far-reaching death. But the wise understanding immortality, never seek the eternal in this life of finite things. That's the nature of everything outside of ourself, is it's finite. Everything has its, its, its expiration date on it, cuts off. And so when you go out there, you make that effort to buy that car, there's this notion, I'm just going to have to redo this again in 10 or 15 years. You know, you paint your house. It's like, oh, I'm going to have to do this again. The roof, I'm going to have to do this again. Everything in this world that you go after is going to go away. It's going to decompose at some point. You know, it's going to become a bucket, by what I tell all, all the time. It becomes a bucket of what? It becomes a bucket of potting soil. So unless you want potting soil, don't go out through the senses. Because anything that you're able to acquire in this world through your senses is going to ultimately be a bucket of potting soil. See that, know that, and quit the rat race now. Decide I don't need any more potting soil. <laughs> we're going to take what we have, we're going to use what we have for the good of everyone around me. You know, I'll feed myself till I'm full, and then the extra I'll give away. That's the path of a householder. If you're not going to be a monk, if you're not going to shut yourself up in a cell and, and deny, you know, push everything away, you want to take the path of being a householder, then the well-being of the society you live in is your responsibility. Those things that you no longer need to collect for yourself, you give to support those around you. And that's how you increase your sense of ego to infinity. Now, Increasing your ego to infinity is the same as reducing it to zero. You know, I had talked to Swami Prabhupada one time, Swami Prabhupada Nanda, when I first joined the monastery. And uh, I, was, I told him, I said, you know, I feel so selfish being a monk. I said, look, I'm locked up in this monastery. I don't talk to anybody during the day. I go sit in the shrine working on my own practice and doing my own stuff. I was like, I just, it just seems so selfish to me, Maharaj. Is it, is, am I missing something? Or is Vedanta just... Selfish. <laughs> and he surprised me a little bit because I expected him to get a little bit defensive and then try and start justifying all of these little things. But he didn't. He said, yes. Yes, it is. It is uh, selfish. But what we're trying to do is to increase our sense of self to include everyone so that we see ourself in everyone's eyes, that we know that we are one, before this energy, which is the self, 
goes through a mind and becomes a personality, before it goes through a body and becomes a gender and an age and a rich or poor, fat or thin, before it goes through all of that, it's the same in all of us. It's one without a second. And it's manifesting, just like in a dream. You can have a dream with a thousand people in it. They're all you. They're all borrowing your mind to exist. And so this world, the sages say, is not so different from a dream. We are that one, that divine nature, that divine spark, shining through various minds, various bodies, but that, there, that it is, as it were, a dream in the mind of God. So know that the nature of, of this sense world is ephemeral. Everything expires, but even more so, it's dreamlike. It won't be what it seems to be all the time. You know, not only do cars and houses and roofs turn into a bucket of soil, but friends, neighbors, children, husbands, wives also become little urns on the mantle at some point. And if we thought that that was our mother, if we thought that was our father, that is the curse of death that we fall into. Because if you identify with the body, you're going to die. Your soul is going to survive. You know, that sense of self, that I, that isness, that, that permeates everything, that remains. But if you don't know of it, if you're not established in that sense of self, you're going to experience dying. And you'll be quite surprised when the process is finished and you're still looking around, you know, <laughs> as this point of recognition. But nonetheless, you'll experience this death. So he says, men of childish intellect and ignorant persons, they run after desires which are external and they enter this trap of far reaching death. But the wise understanding immortality, what's there to understand in immortality? That it doesn't exist in the world of senses. <laughs> that we shouldn't even have the concept because there is nothing in this world that would have taught us about immortality. So it's something that we brought into this world with us. It's a quality belonging uniquely to the I, to the is, to the I am. That's why in the Old Testament, God named himself that, I am. That is what that divine spark or that image of God that was placed within you at your creation in the Christian tradition that's what it is. It's your isness, your being. And that is what God is. So your being here this morning, your existing, is kind of what I see as the signature on a love letter from the beloved to you. I'm not separate from you. I won't walk away from you. I won't leave you. I am your very existence. And to repeat the name of God and to focus on those things in the mind is to come into knowledge of them to poke at this idea. What is this that is within me? What is this thing that recognizes beauty, having never been taught what beauty was? What is this thing that recognizes love, that knows how to love? What is this thing that feels selfishness and hurts from it? What is the nature of this? The same idea is here made clear that in this external world, which is full of finite things, it is impossible to see and to find the finite. I was at a, a, one of these parks in San Francisco and there were those, you know, those big telescope things that you put your quarter in and they allow you to see great distances for a few seconds <laughs> until you put another one in. Well, there was this woman standing and she was looking through at the Golden Gate Bridge, actually, through one of these big binocular things. And her kid was standing there and the kid was just kind of really impatient and just wanting and, and uh, you know, wanting to find her, wanting to, you know, do something and the mother is impatient but is looking through this thing and after a while she's like she comes out and the kid's directly behind her but she looks around doesn't see her kid anywhere and she panics gloria where are you <laughs> gloria's standing right behind her this is what the what what we're being pointed to right here the reason that you can't see the infinite in the finite world is because the finite world is distracting you with change distracting you with glitter and lights and colors you know, when the mind moves, it, it, the mind, you watch it. We're trained, the senses are trained to identify change and to pay attention to change. And so it is, as it were, the self is behind you. As you're looking out through the senses, your nature, that which is fulfilled within you, that which is content within you, that which is unmoving within you, is left silent behind you as all of your attention goes out into the changing. The infinite must be sought in that alone which is infinite. 
And the only thing infinite about us is that which is within us, our own soul, neither the body nor the mind, not even our thoughts, nor the world we see around us are infinite. The seer, he to whom they all belong, the soul of man, she who is awake in the internal man alone is infinite, and to seek for the infinite cause of this whole universe, we must go there. So this is that sincere repentance. It's that sincere desire to know truth, to know love, to know authenticity, to know being, to know purpose. And it's turning away from the senses, no longer looking through the body and through the mind for your gratifications, for your pleasures. The best that any of those things can do for you is distraction. You know, you can go have a really good time on your two-week vacation, but we all know you come back from that two-week vacation and you're already thinking about the next one. <laughs> like, you know, all it does is distract you. You come back, you've got more work on your desk than when you left, more red lights buzzing on your phone than when you left. That's the nature of this world. You know, that's the nature of going out through the senses. His second point, attention is the appeal of the soul to itself, hatred of the world and ascent toward the divine. Sri Nishigadatta talks about this a little bit. He's asked by a questioner, can I think that I am God? And Maharaj answers him, don't identify yourself with an idea. <laughs> if you mean by God the unknown, then you merely say, I don't know what I am. If you know God as you know yourself, you need not say it. Best is the simple feeling, I am. Dwell on it patiently. Here, patience is wisdom. Don't think of failure. There can be no failure in this undertaking. Can't be failed because you already are that. It's just a matter of informing ourselves, of coming to the awareness of, of our awareness. He says, my thoughts, the questioner responds, well, my thoughts won't let me. Mara says, don't pay any attention to that. Don't fight them. Just do nothing about them. Let them be whatever they are, your very fighting them gives them life. See, that fight takes that splitting of self. You have to split, you have to identify with them and give them a voice and give them sentience, and then it becomes this inner fight. So he's saying here that fighting with them gives them life. Just disregard them, look through them. Remember to remember. Whatever happens, happens because I am. Let everything remind you that you are. Take full advantage of the fact that to experience you must be. You need to stop thinking. Just cease being interested. It is disinterestedness, disinterestedness that liberates. Don't hold on. That is all. That's why we talk about attachments, right? If we could just let life come and go as it naturally does, if we weren't constantly trying to take things that are finite, things that are ephemeral, things that are going to expire, if we weren't constantly trying to take those things and make them forever things, we wouldn't suffer. Everybody knows everybody in this room at some point is going to die. Just know that and let it be. Know that the person that you love, when their body dies, they haven't died. They weren't a body to you. What they were to you was love. And so you remember that relationship and your friend is still alive because that was their nature. That was the notion. That was the driving <clears throat> impetus within their being. That love, that intelligence, that existence. And to hold on to that, that will mean that remembering them will bring great joy because you'll remember that presence. you remember that love that was kindled within you. If you hold on to the idea that they were a body, there's suffering in remembering. There's pain in remembering. So remember them for the love that they gave you. That's why you loved them, not because of the body, not because of the mind. So become aware of each other as love within yourself. Know that friendship comes because something about that person is reminding you about the divinity within. Your consciousness shines outward on the screen of the mind, and the world is that reflection. And what's it a reflection of? 
It's a reflection of you. And it's these particulars that we don't need to get all caught up in. This sense of an individual I that's been small, a set of limitations and restrictions. That if we set ourselves up that way, we become small and needy. And we have to, we get interested in everything that the mind is offering, all of those flashing potentials. That's what all of marketing is built on, is waking up that sense of need within you taking your eyes off of a contented self and putting it on a definition of self that will only be perfect with this product or with this vacation or with this accomplishment. So this idea of the self making a cry to itself, you know, it's this notion, one of Ramakrishna's thing is like, this idea of Advaita, that's the highest realization in Vedanta, this knowledge that all is one, one without a second. And there's a path of jnana where we, where we reason that out. We go inside and try and find this one without a second through the pro- different processes of neti neti and whatnot. And he says that bhaktas, people who are following the devotional path, trying to fall in love with Jesus or fall in love with Ramakrishna or Krishna or Buddha, you know that, that those people following that path shouldn't study or shouldn't read those books because it will dismantle their faith. If, if, if thou art that, well, who's this God I'm praying to? Why am I going to bother to pray? You know, And uh, it becomes from that one misunderstanding and that in Advaita, it's not God that disappears. <laughs> it's you that disappears. You go away. God remains. That's the one without a second. And the fact that thou art that means thou without your ego, without the identification with body, without the identification of mind. That is what is God. And that nature of yourself is pure love, pure intention pure intelligence, and pure being. Attention is the renunciation of ignorance and the acquisition of virtue. But to feel that one is a free soul is very good by constantly repeating, I am free, I am free. A man verily becomes free. On the other hand, by constantly repeating, I am bound, I am bound, he certainly becomes bound to worldliness. The fool is one who says, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner, and verily drowns himself in worldliness. One should rather say, I have chanted the name of God. How can I be a sinner? How can I be bound? So it's this setting of the mind. You make a mistake. Brother Lawrence is a great, if he wrote a book, or he, well, a book is written, compiled about him called The Practice of the Presence. And this Brother Lawrence, that was his simple practice, was just always remember that God is present always and it took him 50 years to, or 15 years to establish this thought of god unbroken within his mind and he did it he said by just every moment just checking am i like, god present god is present god is present god is present and he said when i had my falls when i got involved in my vices when i forgot god for a moment i didn't get discouraged about it i didn't get worked up about it i just put my mind back on god apologized, and moved on, didn't give it a second thought. This is a great pointer for us in spiritual life, you know, because a lot of us are making a lot of mistakes. A lot of us have been at this for a very long time and seemingly not getting very far. And so we want to get discouraged, and we start identifying ourselves with failure. And I know this because at every time there's a Q&A, there's always a question about, oh, I can't do this, or, you know, I can't make this happen, or this isn't working, or what's wrong? Just keep your eyes on the divine spark in you. Know it's there. And just keep going. Know that you will be free. Know that you will know the truth. Know that you will find the authenticity and being that you're looking for. And just keep pushing aside the things that are getting in the way. Be disinterested in the things that are luring you out of that awareness. Out of that ability to be fully present here and now. I've chanted the name of God. How can I be a sinner? Attention is a non-doubting certainty on the remission of ignorance. It's this whole notion that when when the divine, all of the incarnations, (laughs) whether it's Rama or Buddha or Krishna or Jesus, they all talk about that grace, that this, this, This that we are trying to accomplish, which is not the way to talk about it, but this that we're trying to accomplish, it 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 already is. It already is. It's not something that we have to build or do. 
It's sitting quietly and coming to the understanding it's what you have always been. To come to know that self that needs nothing, all of the crying loudness of the body and its lack doesn't reach there. All of the mental turmoil of the mind, the moods, the depressions, the, the ecstasies, they don't reach there. All of them are simply observed by that which already has everything. And how do we know it? Because it is projecting everything on the screen of the mind. And we're mistaking those images, those thoughts, as object, as holding something. How can you be bound? You've chanted the name of God. Attention is this non-doubting, this certainty. What, man, what kind of a holy man is, was this? A worldly man would not feel such concern for his sons and daughters. Who was I? Where was my place in society? Down, down below. Now it's getting confusing because this is actually a prostitute talking about her experience of having met uh, Swami Brahmananda. She saw him and she's like, what kind of holy man is this that allows me to come in to meet him? She made an appointment and was able to go in and talk to him. Normally a prostitute would not be able to walk into a monk's room like that, you know, with that kind of friendship, that kind of acceptance. So she's saying, who is this? What kind of holy man is this? Who was I? You know, she was a prostitute. Where was my place in society? Down at the very bottom. I had nothing to expect from the world but hatred and indifference, judgment. That's all that she knew that she could get from the world. I had nothing else to expect. I had no friend. I had no relative. This big world seemed to me like a stranger's house. Nobody talked to me without a selfish motive. Nobody looked at me without a selfish desire. There was none in this world whom I could call my own until that day. And with what undeserved care and affection Swami Brahmananda made me his own. I never saw my father. He died before I was born. I thought to myself, is this what a father's affection is like? Or is this something more? I could not hold back my tears. My lifelong sorrow melted at the, as tears fell from my eyes and I realized, here is my refuge. Here is someone to whom I am not a sinner. I am not an outcast. I am the daughter of Maharaj. He who has, not, who has none is Maharaj's own. He is my Maharaj. He is my father, my heaven, my peace, my God. We had read in books how Sri Chaitanya and Nityananda came to earth to save the fallen ones. You know, all of the avatars, all of the incarnations coming to save, to help us out of our misery, to give us a clue of what an authentic human being looks like. She says, all of these have come to earth to save the fallen ones, and today I have had such an experience for myself, the infinite grace of Maharaj, as if Maharaj had come for sinners like me. There is nothing to fear, daughter. What fear can there be for the Lord's children? What words of hope? What consolation? Maharaj seems to be extending his arms to us, saying, Come, all of you who have fallen. Come, all of you who are suffering. Take refuge in the Lord. He is. Have no fear. May it please the Lord that I will never forget, not even in death, these words of consolation. Now, these are very important words here. You see the transformation that's happening in this woman that somebody finally looked at her and didn't see the front two pieces, didn't see the body and mind that was in the condition of, you know, of, of a sinner or of a prostitute. When a holy man looks at you as a person, he will see that spark of the divinity that is you. He'll see you as your highest self, as the self that you would like written in your obituary. <laughs> that's, what, that's what that holy man sees. That's what God experiences in you. And you need to know that grace is without condition and without limit. And it's important to fully understand that because if you don't fully understand it, you'll take license in it. You'll stop trying because, oh, it's covered. But that's because you're not understanding the nature of this lover. If you were married to the perfect partner, you wouldn't take their perfection and use it for all of, all of your side games and whatnot. 
you would you would fall deeper in love with this person. You would you would constantly wanting to be m- more for them, more that that they they're always the one loving and always the one forgiving and always the one serving and always the one helping you, always the one concerned about you. This is the nature of that divine love of divine that that God that is within. And to know it without doubt, to understand I am a child of that divinity. I am that spark of divinity. My nature is perfect love, perfect unselfishness. My nature is, in fact, perfect freedom, perfect contentment. If we hold on to that idea and don't let ourselves get convinced that we're less than, that we're needy, that we're broken, that we're alone, this is the way that we fight depression by knowing that we're looking through a depressed mind. But we are not that depressed mind. When we're doing things challenging, trying to lose weight in our body, and we can't seem to get that weight off, and we're always beating ourselves up because our self-control is so untrained, you are not that. You are that which is inspiring the effort. You are that which is trying. And that self is infinitely beautiful. You are valuable because of that, not because of what you're doing with the body and mind. You are valuable because of your very nature. Gold does not need to have something added to it for it to be valuable. It is in and of itself beautiful and valuable. You are that. That's what the scriptures are saying when they say that to you. You are that. You are this beautiful divine spark. Repeat that to yourself over and over and over again. Return to it for who you are. When someone asks, who are you? Don't go to the body and say, oh, uh, I'm an engineer. Oh, I'm an architect. Oh, I'm a straight man. Oh, I'm a gay woman. I'm a... Don't go to the body for definitions. Don't go to the mind for definitions. Oh, I'm lonely. I'm kind of depressed. I'm sort of restless. I don't know what to do with my life. No, there is the self which is behind those two silent and still. Why? Because it's perfectly content. It needs nothing. It's simply observing the dream while it is comfortably asleep in the bed, as it were. Know this to be the truth about the situation of this life. And know that because of those understandings, you'll come to see a world that is always conspiring for your success. Not the success of your body. Sometimes it's going to hurt the body. Not for the success of the mind. Sometimes it's going to hurt the mind. But the hurt of the body and the hurt of the mind will always be for the benefit of yourself, that individual soul, that that self which is free, which is authentic you, not battle-torn and weary by being split up between the body and mind. Attention is the beginning of contemplation, or rather it's a necessary condition. For through attention, God comes close and reveals himself to the mind. As we see in the scriptures, it talks about this this unity, that what we're seeing here is all God. It's all God. We've broken it into all of these disparate pieces, chairs, people, men, women, monks, householders. We've broken God into all these objects because we didn't understand who we were in the mirror. We didn't understand that in this reflection of consciousness in the mind, I'm this whole thing. Just like your dream last night, you were actually the entire dream. Everything in that dream you made, you placed there. It was built of your own mind stuff. But for some reason in that dream, you chose only one point of perspective to be. And you called that perspective me. And you lived in your own world, created solely by you, afraid of whoever was chasing you, longing for whoever was loving you, running and trying, working yourself to death, sometimes even waking up out of breath from running in the dream, when you never ran anywhere. That's the nature of life. Know yourself to be the sleeper while you're dreaming. Identify with the dreamer and not with the dreamed. Know that this body is temporary. You've seen it. You've seen a change. We're all adults. We've seen, we, we, we can clearly see that the I that was me as three and the I that me at 57, it's the same I. I'm the same, I'm the same person looking out through my eyes. I'm the same person listening to my ears. But now my ears are hairy, for God's sake. How did that happen? You know? Now my face is lined. You know, my body is melting little by little. 
And yet somehow I remain. I broke my leg a few years ago, in 2008 it was. And I sat there, I had a lot of time to think about that. I couldn't move for like six weeks. And I sat there trying to ponder the fact that the, the body's broken, my leg's broken, there's no doubt. But I couldn't reconcile that with my inner experience because I wasn't broken. I was still experiencing life as I had always experienced life, and yet the body's broken. And I could see that distinction. I could understand. I'm looking at a broken body. I'm inhabiting a broken body. I'm in no way feeling broken because I am not that. I'm not the body. I'm not the mind. So attention. Is that condition necessary for seeing God as the mind becomes calm and placid? In the Upanishadic idea, it's that vision of the moon. We talked about this at, at infinitum. That on the calm lake, if there's no waves, the reflection of the moon is the reflection of the moon. You can see the wholeness. You know what it is. You know that it's one. When that mind is rippled, and what ripples the mind? Thoughts of me and mine. Thoughts born from body-mind. Those ripple the mind. And what happens when the, to the reflection of the oneness in there? It becomes a thousand shards. And it has no resemblance at all to the sphere in the sky. It's just these little shards of light flashing everywhere. And you're looking at them, looking at them, looking at them, unable to see the unity, unable to see the one without a second. That's what maya is. That's what this world is. You're looking at the wholeness. But because of the, the fingers of me and mine that you've got attached to mind, they're stirring up the mind with a thousand thoughts. And it's measuring everything from your body. It's measuring everything from your mind and measuring nothing from the self, which is why it looks broken into a thousand pieces, why it always seems like it needs to be fixed, why it always looks like it's on its way to perfection, but never arriving at perfection. Attention means cutting off thoughts. It is the abode of the remembrance of the divine and the treasure house of the power to endure all that may come. So this cutting off of thoughts, they literally mean cutting off the thoughts. It's, it's really an amazing teaching that in order to be fully present, don't, don't use the mind as a thought machine. Because in essence, you're breaking into two when that happens, right? It has to play back to you. You have to listen. You become those two people. Be fully present. Know yourself as that all-existent self and react to the moment. And in that absolute presence, that perfect self will manifest perfectly. You'll never take a wrong step if you're fully present. To not be present means that you've got some thought castle spinning out that's like two or three steps off of the quiet of the moment. An idea about being a body and a mind, or usually about a business meeting, or judging yourself by your success, or will you get this raise or not. You stand in these places, these little eddies of thought, and measure the world according to that, and you lose your balance, you lose yourself, you get stressed out, you get angry, you get worried, you get concerned. Be fully present. Cut out all the noise of the mind so that you can see things in their fullness, in their wonder, in their beauty, and do what is in front of you perfectly in that moment. Mm -hmm. If, however, in spite of all of your efforts, you do not succeed in entering into this realm of the heart, as I have described, do what I shall tell you, and with God's help, you will find what you seek. You know that in every man the inner talking is in the breast, for when our lips are silent, it is in the breast that we talk and discourse with ourselves, pray and sing songs and do other things. Thus, having banished every thought from this inner talking, for you can do this if you want to, give it the following short prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me. That's the, that's the Christian mantra. For you, for, it's the mantra given by your teacher. If you don't have a mantra, make up a name for God. What, something that represents God to you. Or use a word like love. God is love. You know, uh, thou art that. You know, that's a dangerous one. Don't do that one. But <laughs> these notions. Pick a name of God or, or an idea that represents your highest, your highest uh, ideal. The highest love you can imagine. Or a nickname. 
you don't want to use God. Give him a nickname. Call him Tucker. You know? And sit and meditate on that and let that thought expand within you because that thought will point at love, will point at perfection. You will find what you seek. Use this inner prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me and force it instead of all other thought to have only this one constant cry within. If you continue to do this constantly with your whole attention, then the, in time, this will open for you the way to the heart, which I have described. There can be no doubt about this. We have proved it ourselves by our own experience. So to have, to have this consuming thought of isness, this co- consuming thought of love, to have this consuming understanding of intelligence within, to dwell in that space of perfection, to be perfectly centered on being, full in the moment, the here and now, not an imagined future and not an imagined past, but to be in the present, the only thing you ever have experienced, to be fully here and established in that unchanging, contented, pure self that is the beauty that you are, to live in that space and to be able to go out into the shopping center and not be pulled out into all the music and the songs and the the noise and the cacophony and the advertising and the glittering things and the price tags and the sales and the people, beautiful and hideous, great outfits and horrible, to not be pulled into that at all. You are riding a body, you are riding a mind and you stay atop of it, content, established, full control of yourself, a full knowledge of your nature. And you let that manifest everywhere with opportunity. Ah, there's the the, the peace pilgrim, if you've ever heard of her. She She says that she treats life as if she is the butler of life, that she stands on the edge, constantly aware in every moment that there's an opportunity for service. To live like that, that is what the divine nature is. That's what your nature is. That's why it feels so good to help somebody, because it's your nature. That's why it feels right to love somebody, because it's your nature. Start living according to your nature. Come to the present, the I am, the image of God that is within. Call out its name continually. Never be more than one thought away from the name of your beloved. And he says, you will find this gate to the heart this ecstatic experience of being, this truth that the world is seeking desperately outside. Take some time to think about these things. And then we'll do some question and answers. And uh, I talk, I always talk too long. So if you need to go, feel free to go. But otherwise, we'll do a question and answer uh, after that. It's a wonderful talk. Could you just share it with us? Possibly the best and most helpful that I ever heard. But wow. because of my own uh, being slightly hearing impaired uh-huh. and my understanding, uh, I think you probably already answered the question that I had. But it deals with humility. And I've always seen humility as a practice, something that you have to be aware of to remain humble. Yes. And so I would, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. All right. <laughs> thoughts on humility. Well, humility is the reality of it, right? I mean, we can't control our own mind. We can't control our own body. So humility is really honesty. It's being honest with our, our actual state and things. But tie that to, let's go with a more, a more positive aspect. God's grace, the grace of the divine, the grace of the universe is infinite. God has everything covered. It's a matter of learning to accept that. To accept infinite grace, you need infinite humility because you have to come to the understanding that you cannot offer even one thing except your surrender. That's the only thing you can bring to this picture. Everything that you are and have is borrowed. The very dust of the ground has made your body. You know, the, very, the fields and the flowers and the plants and the animals, they provide your food and your sustenance. Your parents raised you. 
You have of yourself brought nothing into this world. Nothing at all. And so what is it that you're going to give? You know, you have nothing. That's humility. That's that knowing. The only thing we have that is beautiful is that image of the beloved that was stamped here at our point of creation, we'll say, just have something to point to. So that image of the beloved is your only pride. It is your only joy. This I am that you had nothing to do with. You simply came out of the womb enjoying existence. You came out of the womb looking and enjoying love. You came out of the womb aware and open-eyed, trying to learn and understand. None of that did you bring. So humility is just being honest. It's just looking at life and understanding. I have nothing to do, very little to do, with what I am, with where I am. The ego creates the story that keeps it in charge, but you'll find very rarely is the ego actually in charge. Make a plan. You know, one of my favorite examples, I remember in high school, getting together with two of my best friends and saying, hey, let's go to the movies on Friday night. And so this plan kind of kept getting bigger and changing as more people got involved. And on Friday night, we ended up at Caro's with like 12 of us having a big dinner together. And I still maintained within my mind that I had planned this that this was my weekend that I had put together. I didn't plan to meet at Caro's with 12 of my closest friends. I planned to go to the movies with two of my buddies, and this is what happened over time. But as each change was made, my mind adjusted its story to be sure that it was still in charge, that it was still the one making the plan. You know, I can tell you that five days before I started wearing <laughs> an ochre robe, that was nowhere in my consciousness. That I, I was like, that I would be a Hindu monk at no point ever in my life until five days before it happened did that ever occur to me. How can I possibly say that I run my life? How can I possibly say that I'm the one doing things? And every one of us can come up with a story like that. Every one of us has run into situations like that where we're like, well, how did I get here? <laughs> how, did, how did this happen? That's humility, facing the facts. Humility is killing that, that fantasy of ego. I'm in charge, I'm a self-made man. There's no self-made man. You know, when I hear Elon Musk say that, I'm saying, look at how many people are working for you today. Look at how many people are putting cars together to, to come out of the back end of your factory. How dare you say that you're a self-made man? What is that? You're standing on the backs and necks of thousands. So it is with every one of us. And Thank that's where, so much. yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Sure. Uh, great speech, also one of the best I've heard. Um, thank you. Sure. Uh, I'm curious, what was your first experience with the true self? Uh, what led up to it, how was the actual experience, and then how did that affect your life afterwards? You mentioned breaking your leg, but what was the actual experience? Was it one sudden event, or gradual events? Or uh, it's, like? it's definitely a gradual event, um, yeah. The experiences themselves, probably in this forum is not really the right place to air them, but in general, I started paying attention after I got out of college. <laughs> and uh, one event that, that was pivotal was uh, I had gotten out of college. I was a, system, a computer analyst, and I was working for the CSU. And I had, you know, I had everything that I was supposed to have done finished. I got my degree in college. You know, I paid my bills. I, everything was in order. And I came home one night and I was sitting on the edge of my bed and just feeling de really depressed, feeling like that was exhausting. It's exhausting keeping myself entertained. You know, I kind of realized like just, just keeping my own schedule to make sure that I had something going on every Friday night, Saturday night, making sure that I always had stuff going on in my life was exhausting me. And I was laying there, I was looking around my house at the time, I was sitting on my bed, and I looked over my TV, 
And I thought, wow, I remember when that was just 10 inches black and white television. And now, of course, now it's dated, but in those days it was a 32 inch Sony Trinitron, which was the largest TV you could lug into your house with five people. So I saw that, I looked around and saw that that was the condition of everything in my life at that point. I didn't have a single thing more after having done all that preparation than I had during that preparation. It's just that my one room that I lived in was now a house. My little jam box was now five foot high MB court speakers, you know? My little black and white TV was now this Sony behemoth sitting in the middle of the room. My scooter was a car. And I sat there and I looked and I thought, wow, all of my planning in life, my degrees, my work experience, my studies, all of these things just simply increased the size of everything. And I'm sitting here in the middle of it, not one iota happier or more fulfilled than I was when I was in college, enjoying my one room with my 10 inch television. You know? And I sat there and I thought, you know what, if I keep following the principles I'm following right now, I'm gonna wake up one day in a really big house with a fleet of nice cars in the garage, probably several people that are related to me hanging around the periphery somewhere. But I'm still gonna be the same dude sitting in the middle of it, unaffected by any of it, and unfulfilled in the midst of all of it. And I sat there and I did a very California thing. I, I said to myself, my name was Vance before I took my vows. I said, Vance, I give you permission right now to do anything that you think will make you happy. Do anything, I give you permission. That was a very scary thing because I knew I wanted to quit my job. And I was like, oh my God, that's a huge step. Two weeks later, I had sold everything I had. I had quit my job and I had bought a plane ticket because at that time I wasn't thinking spiritual. I was still thinking that what I wanted or what I could become or something fulfilling would be out there. And I was reading uh, 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 For Whom the Bell Tolls, Hemingway. And I was thinking, God, it'd be cool to be an expatriate writer. That would be, that would be really groovy. And so uh, a few days before that, I had read in Smithsonian Magazine that the place for uh, expatriates to be was Prague. This was where it was all happening. There was so much going on there. So I was like, oh, cool. I'm going to go to Prague and write my novel and become the expatriate writer and, uh, and have a fulfilling life. And so two weeks later, I was in Prague. And I was in the dungeon of one, of one of those things, not too far from that famous bridge, typing up my story, you know, at a little, little laptop there and then thinking that was gonna do it. And then winter set in. Winter in Prague is miserable. I can tell you living here, you know nothing of it. It turns dark gray. It's a city of medieval stone. Everything gets cold, nothing gets warm. And it's, it's 11 million people start heating with coal stoves. So that's Prague in the winter. And I was like, suddenly I'm unhappy again. Vance, I give you permission to do whatever you need to do. So I went back to London, picked up another friend, and we went to New Zealand in search of summer, thinking, you know, we'll do that. So I was doing that, traveling around, trying to find something that I thought was gonna fulfill me. I sat on an island in the South Pacific called Rarotonga, in the middle of the night, watching the moon glinting off of the, the, the trees there. And I was thinking, you know, there's 10,000 people on this island and none of them can get off the island. There's not enough economy here to buy a thousand dollar plane ticket to the nearest non-island destination. And it occurred to me, I thought, if there is a meaning to life, like a universal human experience, it would have to be accessible on this island because these people can't get off of it. So there must be, the nature of this thing must be something inside, some, something that I carry with me, you know? And so at that point, I returned to San Francisco, I took back my old job, picked up where I left off, but with a very different search. Now I started collecting information uh, on the Druids, on these different earth religions, I decided that I was gonna actually create my own religion. So uh, I did, <laughs> created it and it ended up this. <laughs> so that, that's a long drawn out, <laughs> way too long uh, story of how I got here. There's other details, but really it was, a, it was becoming aware. 
admitting to myself that my life wasn't working, and then giving myself permission to do the spooky things that it might take to fix it. And that was enough. I think, I think the divine spirit, if you give him that much space, he'll take it and, uh, and move in. Yeah. All right. Swamiji Brahmananda <clears throat> he's now time flies he's over 24 or 5 years since I've known him <laughs> and we were both wearing pants <laughs> <laughs> curtains but, uh, um, so if there's any other question you can take it or more oh okay this will be the last one, and then we'll open, we'll unlock the doors. <laughs> I was fighting in my head, trying to find the right words to formulate my question to be patient with me. Sure, sure. Um, I still believe that the world is a beautiful place, and being here is an example of that. However, with everything that's going on, with all the conflicts and whatnot, some of us have started the journey towards virtual death, like you said. How do you fight, fight empathy and indifference to what's going on because you feel so helpless? Yes. Oh, that's a good one. Feeling helpless. Well, there's a couple things. One, understand that it's, it's, it's the ego immediately that makes you think that something wrong has to be addressed and something needs to be done, something needs to be fixed, because the ego is the doer, and the ego likes to be in charge, and the ego likes you to be in a negative space that it can ride in on a white horse and say, I'm going to save you from yourself, I'm going to do this, we're going to make this happen. Okay, so that's, that's the first place, is orient yourself to know that uh, Sri Nishagadatta says that uh, the only difference between the sage and a sinner is that the sinner... Uh, the sage always sees the moment as perfect, as it is, enjoys its fullness and its perfection. The sinner is always trying to make the moment perfect. All right? So that's the first clue. Open up and, be, uh, and experiment with the different places you have to stand in your mind for your problems to disappear without having externally done anything necessarily for that, you know. And this doesn't always work. It depends on the severity of the problem or the situation that you're in. I understand that. But in general, know that what you seek is here. Then take your eyes off of what is happening anywhere that you don't have control over. You know, one of the debilitating things about media these days is that it gets us all worked out about what's going on in Ukraine. What can you do about what's going on in Ukraine? Absolutely nothing. You can get angry, you can get frustrated, you can get offended, you get horrified, all of these things, and you're just going to have to sit there with them and hold them because you can do nothing about it. Start paying attention to the things that the Divine Mother has put within your control. Start getting incensed about the homeless problem locally and do something. Make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich when you're bored and go find the first person who's hungry to give it to Bring your eyes down from the international scene. That's, that's for elected officials and people that mother's given those responsibilities to. Bring your eyes down to your world. If you're just a dishwasher at, at Outpost Steakhouse, be the best dishwasher. You know, wash that dish as worship, fully with your attention, fully on it, because it's being offered to the I am, to the present moment, and put your whole self into it and do the very best at it and offer it consciously to the Lord at large, to the divine self. You know, here's this first clean plate. Here's the next one. So do with excellence what is in front of you here and now. Keep your eyes on the things that mother has given you charge to take care of and try your very best to manifest your nature into that, your unconditioned love, your pure empathy, and go into that oneness of uh, uh, knowing, seeing the separation of self. You see, if you understand, uh, Sri Nishagata also makes this point. He says, when, when a worldly person sees a person suffering, they see somebody suffering and they want to help. They want to give something to that person. He says, when a, when a holy man sees someone suffering, he suffers. 
because he knows himself and the sufferer to not be different. He knows in that condition, there go I. And his nature alleviates suffering because it's his own suffering. You know? If we go around thinking that we can do, that we can improve and we can help, what we do is build resentment in the world out there because somebody's always going to have to be less than you for you to help them. So what do you do? You frame it. This person and I are the same. I do this act of help, not as help, but as worship. This is an opportunity for me to manifest my nature, the nature of the divine, and that's worship. So if you put those things together, it'll get you started. And once those things get started, they tend to take on their own life. And that inner guru wakes up and you'll get your own ideas from that perspective, from going. All right? We'll call it a morning. Jai Ma, Jai Thakur, Jai Swamiji. Do your practice. <laughs>